What do we see here? A bow. A bow. I get questions from time to time, emailed or texted or what have you. And sometimes I feel that they are deserving, well, most of the time they're deserving of a video, but in this case, definitely. And I had a question from a fellow that was following along in my book, Bowmaker's Notebook. All of you should buy a copy or two. Uh, regarding bow number three, which was a greenwood gullwing bow. Now, the reason I did it in the book that way was because it's a, a green bow. And they're somewhat flexible, so you can take uh, the, the piece of wood and shape it down into a rough bow shape form. Not final tillered, but, you know, thinning it out so it'll dry fast. And then lash it to something to get these shapes in here. You might have to steam it or heat it, too. Don't think that green, green wood will just make tight bends without cracking. Sometimes you do need to conjole it next to a fire, you know, the coals of a fire, heat it up. Anything you can do to get that gentle bend in the bow, green wood, without damaging the wood. Okay, that said, the only reason I do it that way is it's green, it's relatively pliable, and it's easy. You know, you can shape it into a bow and, and lash it down in a shape like this, tie this to something, two by four, piece of log, what have you, block up here and tie this down to get that bend. Taking your time, you can't just like jack that bend into it and, and, and have good, good effects without cracking it. You do have to take care of the greenwood bow, but you can do that more than a seasonal one. Other than that, you know, if you have a seasoned piece of wood, either steam it. And I do use forms when I do it. I don't necessarily steam it and then bend it over my knee. You know, with oak and stuff like that, white wood bows. I'll use a form. I've got my little form, clamp it, steam it, and work it that way. With Osage or Mulberry, they are wonderful for heat shaping. Um, next to a coal, stick it in a brazier. Don't burn it. I use, um, more often than not, my electric range. The electric range is a good tool <coughs> for arrow straightening or, or heat shaping. I did a video a while back. It's the only Osage bow that I've ever heat shaped with a heat gun, and it was a miserable experience because it doesn't put out enough heat to really allow that Osage to turn into rubber. But over the electric range, in my case, you may use something else, coals, what have you. Over the electric range, it has enough heat to really, in conjunction with the grease that I rub into the bow, really blast that with enough heat to then allow me to, and I'll pay a pad. You don't want to do it like this, you know, over a bare knee. I'll take a, a, a hot pad, put it on my knee, and heat shape it like this. I don't need a form with Osage. You get it hot, it'll bend like rubber, wait till it cools. When you're doing this, you do have to be careful that you're not putting a side load in it or else it won't come out straight. It's, you know, very easy to make your bow go off kilter. But just heat shape it. Watch it while you're doing that. You've got some time. Maybe move your knee over here if it doesn't want to bend. Just convince it and hold it in there. You know, until it cools down. And then that's it. Osage and mulberry are beautiful with this type of stuff. You don't need forms. You don't need anything fancy. You just need a hot pad and a knee and a source of heat. That's it. And then I'll go back. When I'm doing the limbs, I don't do it halfway. I'll usually break it in the thirds from like the center of the handle, the tips, there and abouts. And my knee will go here. So it's actually concentrated in here than, more than out here. I want to get it like a third of the way in the concentration of bend. Now, my goal is after I heat bend it, I don't want it anymore. I don't want to have the handle above. If you set it on a flat surface, I don't want to see that handle up here and the tips down here. Because it's like you have just heat bent string following to it. I want to have it kind of like this, you know, a few inches up there, whatever. When you sinew back it, it's going to go into reflex more. You're going to get more here, but... You know, if you're, if you're jimmying an Osage bow, <coughs> even a mulberry bow, it can handle that. It's not going to kill it because tremendous compressional strength. <coughs> I, don't have, I don't have the scourge 
I've got some allergies, so don't worry. Don't cry for me, Argentina. And so that's that. Osage, keep Ben. You don't need forms. Use your name. You know, get the Ben for this gull wing in here. Now, a few notes. We tend to overdo things sometimes. I mean, we're people. And so our goal isn't to, like, have a massive, massive setback in the handle and then these sweeps going out here. Think of it this way. The actual bows, in many cases, except for some patchy bows I've seen, which they go out of their way to have these exaggerated curves, most of them are very subtle. The reason being is this bend in the handle, more or less, just to overcome the string follow. So if you don't have much, think of natural string follow in here, then you don't need much of a setback. Think of it this way. You made a straight bow. It's just a D bow. Just straight. No setback handle, no nothing. You shoot it a long time, and it starts to go a little limp, right? Because of the string follow. How do you counteract that? You can try to bend it out of the limps, but then it's just going to go back. I mean, the damage is, is dead, is done. And so the best way is to set back your handle. So I'm, I'm assuming, I believe that this bow originated from... They wanted to make short straight bows. They received string follow. The bows became a little wimpier, so they set back the handles. And a well-made bow isn't going to have like a major bend in here from string follow, so you don't need to have a major setback in the handle. They'd be subtle for that. Next up in our rambling bow talk. Now, you've put grease onto your mulberry or your Osage bow to help bend it does certain things. It keeps it from scorching last. It, they say the grease soaks in, which it, I don't really believe it does that much, but greasing when you're heat bending is a good thing. But you got this greasy surface on here. Now that compounds the issue you have with Osage because glue doesn't want to penetrate because it's just a very dense shiny wood here. You, you need to get that grease off. I made a video, a video as they say in some foreign countries, made a video on cleaning the bow with a lye solution, Red Devil Lye. The same thing that people that make lye soap make. And so maybe do some um, perusing of soap making videos that use lye and see the concentrations you use. The concentration, I'll let you in a little secret, the concentration that I use <clears throat> in my video is about 50% less than I use on my own. I was just a little conservative because I didn't want anybody to burn themselves in this highly alkaline solution so I went a little below what I actually use but the, the precaution here is if you're going to use Red Devil Lye to soapify and remove that grease from your bowl you better be careful because you can hurt yourself with it you can damage stuff in your kitchen it's dangerous that said if you really want to go about it, it's an effective, really effective way of cleaning it, and it's safe if you use precautions and you're careful. We have stainless steel sinks, so it's not going to damage the sink any. I've got vinegar, just plain old vinegar, handy if I slap it on the ground, which I don't, or get it on, on the um, countertops, I neutralize it with that vinegar, have that precaution. I wear rubber gloves. I would like to say I always use goggles. I don't. I'm just very careful with it. And I'll take that solution. You mix it in there in cold water. Don't mix your lye in hot water. Cold water. Stir it. It'll be foggy. That container will get hot. When it starts cooling, then you can use it. Half a bow at a time. And luckily, these bows are short. And so if you've got a sink side by side, two sinks, one next to the other, you can have this one in this side sink, and you pour it very gently out of your jar. I use a bell jar, a one quart bell jar, or ball jar. Pour it, and it'll drip into that sink. One bow, limited time. Turn it over, make sure all of it's here, and then scrub it with a sponge. And it's cool, it changes the color, it washes some of the orange out, it gets rid of that lye, and what, what's left, it turns it into soap, so it helps you. Then, <clears throat> Run this under under the the faucet, wash it off, <clears throat> and then repeat it on this side. You washed it off, so if it drips on the counter, it's not that bad. <coughs> and that's that. I follow it up. I take my bow, run right into the shower, 
and scrub it with that a sponge and uh, dish soap. Clean it off. And don't don't worry about getting water on your bow. You know, we spend so much time trying to get that moisture level in our bows down to nine percent. But once you do, you can wash the bow in a day or so. It's going to be completely dry. And plus, you have to wait for the sinew to cure. So don't worry about washing your bow in the in the the shower. And that is that. I hope I covered everything. It's a little example of one of my ghost bows. I like this. Uh, this is a bluing. A laundry bluing and it's I wish I knew that the name of the manufacturer it's the same company that produces stuff in the 1800s that the natives in the, the northern plains actually would use this same stuff to dye their bows blue kind of a nifty little thing anyway I hope you've gleaned some information out of this this chat if you have any questions about it by all means just ask and I'll do my best to answer it have a good one stay safe and make a bow. Tomorrow is your day to make a bow.